What I'm going to talk about today is I'll spend a little bit of time talking about API apps, what are connectors, and then I'm going to sp spend most of my time on how you can build one, right? Because uh, there are a lot of people who wanted to build connectors, and they've been asking me, like, how can I build one, and how can we make it work in logic apps, okay? So uh, as I said, we're we'll, uh, going to spend some time how we can build the first connector, and also talk about how you can make this connector work in logic app. There are a few things that you need to do, and I just want to know like, how many of you have tried building an API app and deploying it? All right, not a lot of hands, but, and how many of you have successfully integrated and make it work in logic apps? Okay, <laughs> good. Okay, so uh, there are a few things that you, know, you need to be aware of to make sure that it works well with logic apps. And that's what I'm going to show you today. And also, like, there has been some questions around how do I implement a trigger. I mean, we, had, we saw Stephen talk about what a trigger is. So I'm going to talk about and um, try to create a small trigger, right? A little bit of recap. Uh, we saw that you know, we have released an Azure App Service platform. Uh, essentially, it's, uh, there are different components here. Uh, we have web apps where you can you know, run all your websites, all different kind of web applications, mobile apps. And we also have logic apps and API apps. Now, what I'm going to focus in this talk is the API app, which is where the connectors are, right? Prasant talked about a bunch of API uh, connectors. He, we saw a lot of uh, less of connectors. So all of them are API apps, right? So the API apps provide a powerful platform for building and managing your APIs. So if you are developing an API, it has a rich set of toolings that you can use, and we'll, so we'll see some of them, how you can do that. And it, not only that, it also provides a set of platform capabilities that allows you to manage your APIs once it is deployed, right? So it's good for people who are developing APIs it's good for people who are, develop, who are managing those APIs, as well as we have a set of toolings that you can use if you want to consume those APIs, okay? And the other thing is, once you build an API app, it can be consumed from any type of, uh, any type of app. So it can be consumed from web apps, it can be consumed from mobile apps, it can be consumed from logic apps, right? And the last thing is, we have a rich, set, uh, rich ecosystem of, um, of API apps, so we have a marketplace where you can you, where you can where you can go and publish your API apps, and then people can you know download buy those APIs, and so we want a rich yeah, ecosystem in place. So uh, because many of you have already seen how it works, so I'm going to skip some of the slides and directly go into how you can build your uh, APIs. There was. Okay, good. So uh, let's see. Um, so how you build your first connector, right? The basics, what you do. So instead of talking about you know, a few slides, what I'm going to do is I'm directly going to jump into Visual Studio and let's see how we can get started by uh, building a first uh, connector, okay? Okay, so... Um, this is a, so I'm just trying it out. So there are a couple of projects already in place. Uh, one of them is uh, fully working, sample, uh, store, Azure store is Q connector. Okay, that's what we are trying to build here. Uh, I just have it in place because in case something doesn't work, I can fold back to it and show you how it works in the code, right? So the first thing you do is you add a new project in VS, okay? So and you can see uh, there is an ASP.NET web application, right? So Karan talked about how API apps work in general, right? And we said, okay, it's run on the same platform which is, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, hosting uh, web apps. So it's the same set of technologies that you use, right? You don't have to learn new things. So we'll start with creating an ASP.NET web application. And it's and you can select a bunch of template that we provide. Now, as you, you can either select a web API, okay, which is if you are developing a web API, or if you have an existing web API, you can convert that easily into an API app, 
Okay. We also provide a template for developing an API app. So this is where you start, basically. So <coughs> the difference between the web API template and an Azure API template is there are a bunch of metadata that we additionally generate, basically. And then you know it will uh, add a couple of uh, SDK references and then add a couple of uh, additional metadata. So what we'll do is for, we'll just select this API app and you say create. Okay. And you can see that it's creating a new uh, API app project, right? Let's just hide this. So there is nothing special about this project. So it's trying to install a new get package. Uh, it's trying to download and install the SDK. That's why it's creating it. So that might take some time, okay? That's why I had a project ready. Okay, so once you create this, uh, what I'm going to show you is once you create this, you can see that uh, there is a file called apiapp.json, okay? While we get this one, I will, I'll just quickly explain what it means. So the apiapp.json contains a bunch of metadata about what your API app is, right? It is used by the platform to, uh, to display what information about your APIs. For instance, you can say what is the ID, so you may want to give an ID for your API app. Uh, you will want to give your namespace, a title for it, a summary, brief des description of what that API app is, who is the author, and so on, right? And additionally, one important point is, um, it also says there are endpoints, basically. So there is an API definition, so, and there is an endpoint which is defined as slash swagger docs slash one, right? So this is the endpoint that is that is exposed by this API to uh, where you can go and retrieve the metadata about that API, like what kind of operations are being exposed by this API, okay? And it is, and it is in the form of a Swagger, um, uh, it is in the form of Swagger documentation, right? So Swagger is a format that can be used to describe your know, REST APIs, and we support that, right? So the other thing that it does is uh, it adds a couple of uh, SDKs, and one thing that you see is there is an SDK called Azure App Service API App Service. This, this is the SDK which uh, contains you know, the, the uh, SWAS buckle and some of the other tooling which is required for API apps, right? So for instance, if you had uh, created your own web API, what you could have done is you could have gone here and you can say add, and there you can see that Azure API app is the case. So once you do this, you will get an API app. You would have converted an API app, in, uh, you would have converted a web API into an API app, right? Okay. So, uh, so for this, uh, let's just set this one as our startup project. So this is a basic web API, right? And I believe it has, uh, you know, by default, we just created a controller class with a bunch of methods, right? Get, get by, which doesn't do anything, post, put, and all the stuff, right? So you can, you can compile this project, and you, know, you can just run it locally. And this would fail, right? But if I go to, okay, Swagger, okay, it's not there, right? So I'll tell you what that means. So, so this is a, a fully functional web API. What we'll do is, there is something called Swagger config.cs, right? Swagger, as I said, right, the API app exposes metadata, and that metadata is in the form of a Swagger, uh, format, right? So what we provide out of the box is how you can generate those metadata dynamically, right? So, and that is done by having this uh, Swagger config and you enable the Swagger here, right? So you can also go there and enable what we call as the Swagger UI, basically. So this is very helpful if you want to test your API locally, you, you will get a Swagger UI. So I'll just uncomment this line, okay? Uh, build it again. Oops, did I comment, comment something more? 
right. All right. So let's build it again. And this time, I just want to show you this tool. So you see a, a UI, which is a Swagger UI, where you can see the uh, APIs, the, the APIs that this web API is implementing. And you can see all the operations, and you can try and see how that works, right? So you can locally try, and you can see the response body and so on, right? So right now, it's, uh, it's not very interesting for us. And if you want to see the actual Swagger, uh, for Swagger format, you can go th to this URL. Sorry. And just copy paste this URL. And uh, if you just ask for this URL, and you can see the Swagger format here, right? So this describes what the API looks like, okay? So now, w once you have uh, built your API, what you can do is you just want to deploy it, right? You, you want to have your actual API running on Azure. So there are a couple of ways you can do it. You can package this, go to the Azure portal, create an API app, and you know, upload the package, and you can get it working. Or you can also deploy it directly from Visual Studio. So for deploying from Visual Studio, you go to the publish, and you have different publish targets. So if you're using ASP.NET, this is, there are different, different publish targets for ASP.NET. Uh, so you have this Azure Web App. So we have, there is a new publish target called Azure API Apps Preview. You select that one, right? And this will... Uh, list all your existing API apps. So if you have already, if you have gone to the portal and created an API app, blank API app, you can select it from this list and you can select your API app and you can publish the, your API app over there. Or if you want, you can just go and uh, create a new one as well. Okay, so when you create a new one, uh, new API app, you provide the same set of uh, inputs that we were asking, right, when you create from the portal like what is the name of the API app, what Visual Studio subscription, uh, what is the app service plan and all resource group, what kind of resource group you want. So the same set of inputs that you provide when you create any API app, you can provide it from here and it will create. Now I'm not going to you know, do that because it takes some time. So I'll just skip this part, okay? And what I have is, uh, Let's unload this product, good, okay? So what I have is, I've done the same thing here, okay? And I have deployed this one, I've published this first time. So when I go and publish this a second time, uh, it should be a lot faster because all the packages would have been uploaded so it will you know, update only the ones that have been changed in my project. So it should be a lot faster for me so I can just go ahead and publish this one. And I'm publishing this in a resource group. Um, where is that? Okay, this is the same profile that we have, Bistock Summit RZ is the name of the resource group, right? So I can go ahead and publish this. And uh, this is just spin up. Let's see what's happening. All right, okay. So this will just go and publish that API app on Azure. Now this API is like, successfully created, right? So once I go and create this API app, you, you, if you go up to the portal, uh, okay, so this is the portal. So if you go to the portal and if you browse for your API apps, uh, you should see the one that you know, we have created, right? So just publish this demo connector. So this is the one which is coming up, okay? Ignore the rest of the API apps, I was just doing that. Okay, this is the one that I created because it's West Europe. Um, the resource group that I tried out is in West Europe. Earlier I was trying in West US, it was taking too much time, so I created one in West Europe. Okay, so this is the one that we just published, all right? So now, once you publish this, you can start using it in uh, your logic apps, right? So before we go there, uh, let's just quickly add a couple of methods over there, okay? So. 
So what I've done in this demo connector is I just created a, an API app. I removed the, def I removed the uh, what is that, uh, the controller that comes with the sample, and I just created one called the message controller. That's because we wanted to uh, build a connector for Azure uh, Storage Queue, right? So uh, what I have done is uh, I have created a web config and add a key for it, okay? Where I'm going, to, I'm defining the connection string for the storage queue that I want to connect to, and I just created a queue client for it. Okay. Now I'm going to add a bunch of methods over the here. So what I'll do is I'll just go back to. Um, so I'll just go back to what I have here. This is the one that I've created, and it's really. Quite simple, right? So I'm just copy, copy paste this part. Actually, I can just copy paste this at whole. Sorry. Right? And I'm just going to put it here, right? And we'll see what those are in a moment, okay? So uh, one of the methods that I've created is I've created a get message, okay, that takes a queue name, right? And I get a reference to the queue, and I just call get message on that queue, and whatever message that I got, I just return it back. It's a very simple API, right? To retrieve, to fetch a message from the queue, right? Similarly, uh, I also have a delete message, okay, which takes the name of the queue. Now, in Azure queue, when you when you uh, check out a message from Azure Storage queue, it's invisible for some time, okay. Uh, that time is configurable, it's invisible for some time, but when you check out, you get a message ID as well as what you call as the pop receive. Basically, that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lock basically on that message, so that only you know that you have checked it out, and when you want to delete it after you have finished processing it, uh, you, need to, you need to provide that same uh, pop receive token, right? So I take those input, the message, I, the message that you want to delete as well as the pop receive for it, and what we'll do is we'll just call delete message on it. So these are APIs that the Azure SDK has already provided, right? So it's, it's quite simple. And then I have this uh, method called send message, right? Which takes a queue name and one the message to be sent, right? And you get a queue, uh, you get a reference to the queue. You construct a message from the message text and you just add it to the queue, right? So these are the four, three uh, actions that I've added in my controller. Now if I go and build this, hopefully it should work. Okay, and uh, this is the one. Right, so I can even locally try it out and see you know, how that works, right? So let's quickly do that using this Swagger UI. All right, so I can see these three APIs that I've created, okay? So, um, let's see, okay. You try to get a message on it, it asks for a queue name. So what I will do is, uh, let me expand this, and where is stores queue? Stores is here, okay. And I have a few queues that I've created here. Okay, and let's say, let's try to use this incoming queue. I don't think I have anything here, but let's see. Okay, there's nothing here. So let's just use this. Okay. And so I have a message in my queue that I just added. Now using this API, what is the name of the queue? It's called incoming, right? So I can say incoming. I can try it out. And I should be able to get that uh, message, right? So, uh, so this way, I mean, when you develop an API, I'm, you are still in VS. You are using the same uh, technology that you are familiar, right? There is nothing new here, okay? We just give you a Swagger UI that allows you to try it out. Uh, that's cool, okay? So uh, once I have this built in, okay, we know that sort of works. 
So what we'll do is uh, we will publish this again, right? So bear with me for some time. Uh, so API is successfully published. And so let me just go back to my slide now, right? So this is what we have seen so far, OK? Some of the tools and SDK that we need is right now we have Visual Studio uh, 2013, which is required. And the Azure SDK 2.5.1 or above is what you need. And what, you, what we did was we wrote a web API. Uh, we made it into an API app, OK, by adding the Azure API app SDK. And we just edited the API app.json. You know, I just provided some summary te text. And we tried to test it out locally with the Swagger UI, and we published that API app, right? So you, sh you should be, you know, once you do this, right, it's very, it shows that it's very easy to create an API app, right? It's just like any other web API. And you're not learning something new altogether, right? So, <clears throat> So, so this would get you, you know, started, basically. But, the, but what you'll find out is when you try to use something that you have created like this in Logic Apps, there are certain, certain gaps, basically, which is missing, right? So which is what I'm going to show you right now, OK? So, so let's go to the portal. So I have created uh, empty Logic Apps. Okay, just so that we can try out, you know, how that API uh, app or what the connector that we're de developing looks like, right? So this is what we we published. So if I put this one here, and it asks me, you know, we should be able to see, you know, a bunch of actions, right? So one thing is you can see that okay, there are actions like get messages, send messages, delete messages, right? All these things are coming up. Uh, let's say I want to do a get message. Okay, it asked me for a queue name, so I can type uh, the same thing incoming, right? But it doesn't show me anything, okay? So, but the good thing is, it is a fully functional API app that we published. So, if I save this one, okay, and uh, one, sorry, if I save this one, and uh, where is that? Where do I go to the next one? Can't scroll it, so let me close it. And if I run it now, it should just work. Okay, so it's running. So it looks like it's running. Takes some time, but this should also work. Now this is this is the API app is running on Azure. I'm trying to make it work on Logic Apps. And takes time, huh? Not showing up. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll wait for some time. Probably uh, the data is not yet synced. Okay. So, but 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 you you must have mentioned two. You must have seen two things here, right? One is uh, I want to show you two things, right? One is uh, the name is not that great, right? Messages underscore get messages and all the stuff, right? So you want to provide a nice display name for it, right? And the second thing is it's, it doesn't show me what the output is, right? So those are, you know, the basic stuff that we need to get fixed to make it work with logic apps, right? So for display name, what the way it works is <coughs> the logic app will query the Swagger metadata for the API and then use that Swagger information to decide, okay, what is the display name it's supposed to use, right? For operations, uh, there is a called summary, okay, uh, which it uses to display. And for parameters and properties, uh, we have a, a specific vendor extension called XMS summaries, which you can provide. And the second thing that we said we talked about is the response type. And because the, the response was not showing up for the get operation because uh, there is no default response field that we are given, uh, we'll most likely fix it in one of the future releases. But right now, you need to have a default response in the Swagger, OK? And then there are a couple of other advanced operations, which uh, if you have seen, if you have played around with some of the connectors that we have defined, 
there is an option to select to show only a subset of the operations that the connector implements, like the most basic ones, because we don't. There is uh, there is uh, only a limited real estate in the designer, so we have a expand button which you click on it and you can see the full list of operations, right? So those are some of the advanced uh, operations and proper properties that you can define on your connector. And the way you can do it is again by an extension on the Swagger metadata, which is called the SXMS visibility, and you can either put advanced or internal, okay? So uh, before we get into how you can customize that, I just want to talk about SWAS buckle because we have seen that you know when you click on Swagger slash you know, doc slash v1, it dynamically generates the metadata for the connector, right? So this is how that metadata looks like. This is how the Swagger metadata looks like. So it tells you what is the API path you have, okay? What, uh, what operations that you support, so you give an operation ID and all, what parameter it takes, and so on, right? Now, Swazbuckle is a very powerful tool. Uh, it's, you know, it makes you, makes, uh, so it allows you to customize how you can generate this swagger, right? And the way you do it is through what we call as filter. So there can be filter on operations, schemas, and documents. Operations is, you know, the API operation that you have, right? And all of these are in the swagger config file. So if you go back here, and uh, if I go to, If I go to my connector, you have this file called Swagger Config, right? And this is what we use to enable the Swagger UI. But there are a lot of customizations that you can do here, right? You can, you can go and read like what those are. But the, one of the most important customizations that you can do is you can provide an operation filter. An operation filter is, is a piece of code that this uh, Swagger will call before the swagger of that particular operation is generated. So if you want to customize something, you can do that, right? And what we will do is we will use that to customize, uh, first to customize you know, how you can put the summary tag, right? So in order to put the summary tag, Swagger also has the feature to uh, use the XML, XML comments that you provide in your documents, and we'll try to use that, right? So you just have to uncomment this line, get XML comments, and it asks for a part, basically. So this is a function that you need to implement, right? So if you just implement this function, it should have it come somewhere here, right? And uh, we can just refer to, okay. So, so this function is supposed to return the XML command file for your API, right? So before you do that, what you do is you go to your project, and project has an option to generate XML files. It should be in the bill, right? So say XML file, and you generate this XML commands, right? Let me just change something XML. All right? And we can do that for all configurations. Oops. Right? Okay, I think there's some problem. Right, so when I build this project, now the XML uh, documentation of this project will get generated here. Now I need to go to this Swagger implementation and provide a path to it. And we can just see how that works. So what I'll do is I'll just copy paste this line, right? Uh, that's because I don't remember this part. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm just picking up that XML com command file. So the only thing is, it's called demo connector, right? So we had the XML command file generated here in the bin folder. So we'll just put this and save it. And uh, when we do that, Let's try to build this. Okay. Let's just run it. Okay. Whoops. All right. Is it missing? 
that's what happens. Okay. So uh, now when I when we run this one and look at the swagger for it. Uh, if you see this one earlier, there was no get message, send message, and all this stuff. All these are coming from the API documentation that I have in my code, okay? So you can see that parameters have the descriptions, nice descriptions, and all this stuff, right? So there's a few lines of code that you need to make, and you know you will just get the swagger stuff. You can verify it by opening this, and you should be able to see the new swagger has the summary field here, right? The summary field, and uh, it has the nice description for all the parameters and all, right? So, so this is good. So, uh, but still I said, you know, for the operations, uh, we don't have a summary field, so what you need to do is, you need to add, um, you know, a, an operation filter to ensure that you can add the specific vendor extensions, and the way, is done, and I'm not going to go there right now, as I'm just going to show you like how that can be done, okay? So uh, this is the way you can add it, right? So you can define an operation filter and, and just add it in your uh, Swagger configuration, right? And the operation filter, in the operation filter, uh, there's an apply method, and it will just add a you know, bunch of, uh, you can just modify it. Right? So uh, what I'll also do is, I'll also ne I need the uh, output of my API coming up, and I said that's because we don't have the default response field, right? So what I'll do is, uh, this is a filter that I've created, and I'll walk you through um, what it does. Uh, what it will do is, uh, this filter is invoked by Swazbuckle every time it wants to generate this swagger for a particular operation, and it passed me the operation, and a bunch of other stuff, right? So what I do is uh, I look at the operation, I look at the responses for it, and I see if it is a 200, I just add an entry uh, for the default here, right? So I'll say operation.responses, add default, and you know I'll get the same uh, schema that I returned for 200, add it as a default response here. Right, so I'm going to add this operation filter in my class, and control C. So let's add this one. And the, what I will I need to do is uh, all right. Okay, this is the one, right? What's the name? Add default response filter. Okay, so I just go there. So I'll just add this one, right? So now, oops. Can all right? Yep. Now, when I uh, generate the swagger for it, and I expand it, I should be able to see the response as well, right? So I can see that uh, there is a default response code, and it has a schema for it. Now, if I go and deploy this one on the cloud, let's go and publish this on the cloud. So the API app is published, and if I go back here, I still need to refresh this, right? So let's delete this. And, uh, okay, uh, I think I need to refresh this one to make it work because it has a cache of the uh, previous swagger, right? So, uh, so I have created, uh, you know, uh, I have enhanced the Swagger definition to add the response and to add the uh, XML comments for it. Now, if I go and use it in Logic Apps, I should be able to see most of those things. OK. 
Okay, I hope it will face the new one. Yep, so you can see that now you know, th there is a response the object, right? Which is what the uh, storage client is giving me. So if I, if I go and get a message from the queue, now I can see that, okay, what is the pop receipt time? What is this as a string if you want to read the text and all? So I get everything here. So now I have a better uh, API app that works better with uh, logic apps, right? So, so let's go back here. Okay, so uh, this is what we have done. Now the next thing that I want to talk about is so far what we have you know, allows you to build an API app, which is a connector basically, and you can consume it from logic apps, right? But if you have used some of our connectors that we have built, like SQL, okay? It has the ability to go and, go and check to a configured a SQL database. It, let's say you want to insert a row into a table, a SQL table, right? It, it has the ability to go to the table and find out, okay, this table has these columns. Right? So when you read data from it, it gives you a strongly typed uh, output for that particular table. Right? Or if, when you want to insert something into it, it gives you a strongly typed input that says, okay, these are the columns. So the way we do it is we dynamically generate the swagger for it by going to that external system and then you know, uh, retrieving information about you know, the, the, the SQL table and then providing you the necessary inputs and the output parameters. Right? And this is very useful. And we use it in SQL, we use it in Salesforce, SharePoint, and a bunch of other connectors that we have. Right? So it, is, it enhances the user experience for somebody who is using this logic app. Right? You can have strongly typed input output. And you know, if you're using it, if, uh, for the end user, he doesn't have to remember, for instance, okay, what are the fields, and so on. Right? So what we will do in our store is, uh, Connector is it would so today if, if I when I use that storage connector it asked me for the name of the queue right so it would have been nice if my storage connector can actually go to my storage account and find out okay what queues it have right what are the list of queues that I have in my storage account and then provide provide it as some sort of a drop down right so that I can just go and select you know the queues which are there right so let's see how that can be done. So, uh, so what I'll do is, uh, so I will go to, again, the same Swagger file, okay? We are going to add one more uh, filter for the operation. And the way I'm going to do it is, so if I look at the Swagger file for uh, my connector, right? It has a queue name as one of the parameter. Now, the queue name is, a, is of type string. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to say that this particular parameter ha can take some uh, fixed set of enumeration, and the enumeration would be the list of queues in my account. Okay, so uh, so what I have done is I have implemented again one filter called the discover queue filter, which I'm just going to put it here, right? And uh, wish there's a better way to navigate. It. And you can just add it anywhere, actually. So let's just add that filter. OK, I still don't have that. And the implementation for this discover queue filter is this one. Let's, let's just copy this, and then I can show you like how this works. Right? So just like we added a filter for adding the um, default uh, response. What we'll do is, in this filter, uh, we wait, which we'll call link. Right, OK. So we'll just see what it does. Right. So again, what we'll do is, uh, of course, I mean, uh, we will look for a parameter called queue name, okay? And if you find the parameter, we are going to, <coughs> if you find the parameter, we are going to add an enum uh, field into that parameter, saying that this parameter can take this enum, right? 
And uh, what we will get, uh, what we will add in the enum is the, all the queues which are there in my account. So I've just created a function called get queues. So whatever this uh, value that this get queue will return me, I'm just going to add it in the enum, right? And I'll show you how the swagger looks like once we do that. Uh, all right, so this get queue is really reading, reading the uh, connection string from the app settings, okay? It's creating a queue client based on that, and then it just lists the queue, and I'm just going to return whatever queue that I found there, right? It's a very simple, you know, uh, line, uh, simple piece of code, right? Which anybody can write. So now we build this, and uh, again, let's see how that works. So let's try it out here locally. And right, I got it. So if I do a get now, and you can see that there is a drop down here, right? So these are the queues that I have in my. Uh, storage account. So if I just go back to my storage account, you can see that I have all the SKUs, right? So that I've created. So if I create one more and try to load this swagger again, so let's just say create a queue, like a demo queue. Right? So this queue has been created. Now if I try to create this again, and I haven't tried this before, so Hopefully this should work. <laughs> yeah, okay, I can see that queue that is created, right? So what it does is uh, it's dynamically, you know, uh, generating this swagger by going to my storage account, listing the queues, and adding those queues when the swagger is generated, right? And if I go and open that swagger, the way, uh, the way it works is So the way it works is there is a queue name, and this is what I've added in my, to my operation filter, right? So I've added, I saw that in, the, in my code, I added an enum for it, and in the enum I just list uh, all, the, all the possible values for this particular parameter, right? So, uh, so now if I go and deploy this, I can go ag ahead and publish this again. And if I go back to uh, the logic apps, in the logic app also I should be able to see a drop down which lists all the queues, right? So, so let's again go back here, right? So what we saw, what we did was so far we have added a summary and other documentation in your API metadata by enabling uh, XML commands, right? Uh, we have also added some operation filter to customize your swagger, and we have done uh, two operation filters so far. One is to add uh, for a default re response that makes your API app work with logic apps and so that it can show the uh, output. And the other one is it can, it dynamically generates some enumeration so that uh, you know, we are, you are able to discover what queues you have in our storage connector, right? Uh, cool. So, so now the other topic that I want to talk about is how you write a trigger, right? So if I go to my API, uh, to, to the portal, okay, and uh, I want to refresh this again. So. I can, I can use my API app, and it gives me a bunch of uh, actions, right? Get, message, send, delete, right? And this is a very, uh, it, it's functionality that's complete in the sense that, I mean, it gives you all the, all the uh, actions that you can, in, you can possibly interact with a queue, Azure queue, um, all the message-based actions, right? However, I mean, it would be nice if you can write a trigger as well that will run the logic app when there is a message on the queue. Today, if I have to use it, I will have to probably have to use a recurrence trigger to check if there is a message and so on, right? So let's see how we can write a trigger. 
So uh, today morning, Stefan talked about triggers. Uh, there are a bunch of triggers which are available. Uh, it can be, so it is used to define when logic gaps are run. So it, it means it can run it manually, or it can be based on some recurring schedule, or there are webhooks that you can provide. But a trigger can also be defined by connectors, and there, it can be polling or push space, right? Um, <clears throat> And in this example, uh, we are, I'm going to talk about how you can write a polling-based uh, connected trigger. And this, Stefan briefly talked about this, that there, are, there, there is this 200 and 202 semantics. Uh, so a connected-based trigger is really nothing but a special type of uh, API that the connector is implementing. Uh, there is some contract that I'll explain uh, that you need to follow. And it, it returns two type of responses. One is 200, which says I have data, therefore run the logic, right? Or otherwise it will return a 200, 202, which says I don't have any data right now, so don't run the logic, but check for data after some time. So you keep polling, basically, right? So this is a contract that we define. And then we also have what we call as a trigger state parameter that can be used to externalize a state so, so think of it this way. Uh, when, you read a, uh, when you read a message from a queue, as I said, when you, when, when you use to read a message from a queue, you get the message ID as well as the pop receipt, right? Unless you go and delete that message from the queue explicitly, uh, you will, that, uh, that message will be invisible for some time, but after some time, it will again you know, become visible. So if you, go, if you don't delete it, you will keep on reading the same message over and over again, right? But if you don't want that behavior, what you can do is you, you can pass that, the, that message ID and the pop receipt as part of the trigger state and give it to the workflow, saying, I have read the message, this is my trigger state. And then when the workflow calls your connector again with the same trigger state, you can retrieve the message ID and the pop receipt, and you can now go and delete that message because workflow has processed that message, right? So that is what we are going to do for uh, trigger, okay? The next thing is, uh, as I said, there are certain things uh, that you want to optimize for logic gaps. For instance, the trigger set parameter itself is something which is interesting for a developer, but for the guys who is consuming it from the logic app, it's not very interesting, right? And this is, I mean, why would you care about, if you, are, if you simply want to use your connector uh, to fire a trigger, why do you want to care about, okay, what uh, expression should, should I enter in the trigger state, right? So there are certain optimization that you want to hide the specifics, uh, the logic app specifics for implementing trigger, okay? So <clears throat> let's see how we can do that. Uh, so again, uh, no surprises, what we're going to do is we're going to add another operation filter in Swazbuckle. Uh, you know, after implementing that uh, trigger API, right? So the trigger API that I have, I'm just going to copy paste this one. So we'll add one more API in our message controller for the trigger, right? And I'll show you what this API looks like, right? So a couple of things. Uh, one is a trigger is an HTTP GET. Right, because you want to return 200 or 202. Uh, it has in its name the word trigger, so that you know, uh, logic app will know that it is a trigger, okay? And it has a parameter called trigger state. So these are only three things that you need to know how to, when you implement the trigger, when you define a trigger, right? Okay, and uh, so once I do that, it can, I said it can return 200 or 200 okay. So what I'll do is, uh, I will check if there is, was a trigger state that has been passed. If there, is, uh, if there is a trigger state that is passed, I'm going to split it, and I'm going to extract the message ID and the pop receipt, and I'm just going to delete that message, because I know that that message has been received by workflow, right? Next thing is I'm just going to get a message from the queue. All right? So if I don't have any messages, right, what I, what, is, what I said was I have to return a 202. So uh, what we provide is uh, this is an extension method 
that uh, the SDK provides, which says you wait until f you wait for the next polling interval, right? And this is implemented in this namespace, okay? So this is provided by our runtime SDK, and you go there, let's put it here, and this should just work, right? Okay. But now if I have a message, okay, there are a couple of things that I need to do, right? <clears throat> Uh, you need to construct the new trigger state, and the new trigger state is really nothing but the message ID plus the pop receipt. I just concatenate stuff, right? And you need to send the new message back, as well as tell workflow to pull immediately because I may be having more messages in my queue, right? So what we provide is uh, we also provide uh, event triggered on the request, the extension method on the request object, where you can specify the output Okay, with the data that I want to return, and the new trigger state, okay? And uh, you want to say that you want, to, you, you want the logic app to pull you again immediately, right? So that because there may be more data. That's it, and once I do that, <coughs> there's one last thing that I need to do is to define what the response type is. Given this, we have the response type is HTTP response message, which is not very interesting because this is not the object that we are actually response. We are sending back. We are sending back the cloud uh, queue message, basically the message from the queue, right? So if I build this now, and uh, why don't we just directly go ahead and publish this? So, uh, so what I've done is I've now implemented the trigger. I published that, right, to the cloud. Now let's go back to our portal again. Uh, I'll have to refresh this because I want to get the box connector that we have. Like this is a service bus uh, connector that we have provided. So I have the same message available uh, trigger, which, oops, what happened? So stuff. Let's just try this again. So I go and delete this. Let's try to add a service bus connector. I'll do it slowly this time. And so you can see that it doesn't ask me for a trigger state, right? Now that's because. Um, so let's just save this, and uh, we'll see what happens behind the scene, right? So you can see that there is a trigger, which is a service bus trigger, and there are in different inputs that we provide, and one of the parameters is a trigger state here, and you can see that we still have this parameter called trigger state, right? But it doesn't show up on the designer because of the uh, vendor extension that I talked about, which is the XMS visibility that we use for advance. So we, if, if we look at the Swagger metadata for the service bus connector, it's only because, uh, it's not showing up because we say for this particular parameter is a type of internal, so we don't show it in the designer. And we also have another parameter to say that use this expression basically, right? This expression is really, you know, um, trying to compute what was the last trigger state that we got and just pass it along, okay? So, uh, so that is the last part that we need to do. And for doing that, uh, we have this uh, trigger state filter that we have, we have defined, which says, okay, let's just copy paste this one and add it and we'll be done, right? So, And then what we do is uh, we will add this one.
right? We'll add this and uh, string comparison. Okay. All right. So uh, what this uh, filter will do is we'll see if the operation is a trigger, right? And uh, we look for the trigger state parameter. Okay, we look up for the trigger state parameter, and then um, we will add a new vendor extension to it, which is really say, okay, it is an internal uh, parameter, so don't show it in the designer, and use this value for uh, the value of the parameter, right? So once we do this. Okay, once we do this and I publish it. Here, I mean, if, if I go, uh, so once I do and publish this one, all right, this uh, dictionary is not there. Okay, generics, right. All right. Okay, so, uh, so this is the last one. So once I publish this, uh, you will have a fully working um, API app, right? So I don't have to, I will just refresh it, you will find that the trigger state is there. Now you can start using it. So it's a fully functional uh, storage queue connector that has one trigger to retrieve, uh, to kick off a workflow or to kick off a logic app when there are messages available. And there are th three methods, one to get a message, send a message, or delete a message from it, right? And uh, so uh, there are a set of new st steps, basically, but I don't have a lot of time. I mean, I, uh, we can show you like how you can debug your API app, uh, how you can write a hybrid API app, well, how you want to use OAuth, how you can use diagnostics and error handling in your API app. And lastly, which is very important, is how you can package your API app and publish it in the marketplace. Right now, you cannot do it, but we, uh, our vision is that we will have a marketplace where you, know, you guys can come, write your API app, write your connectors, and fill the marketplace with a lot of connectors, right? So uh, key takeaways, we have a powerful platform for API. And we want to have a rich ecosystem for distributing and monetizing your APIs. And we're looking for third parties to develop <coughs> API apps, to develop the connectors. And as Karan has mentioned in his keynote, we will, and we will definitely need your help in making sure that there are a lot of connectors in uh, the marketplace, right? And when you develop your API app, it's really easy to develop API app. It's the same set of technology that you already know. Um, uh, there are only you know, I've shown that in 30 minutes you can have a working sample uh, API app connector easily developed and deployed. And therefore, try it out, give us feedback, and we'll definitely like to hear uh, your inputs on this one. Okay, any questions? Thank you.